Good morning, everybody. Um, this is the biweekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. I'm Alan Sherman, uh, Director of the Lab and Professor of Computer Science. Today, it's our pleasure to have an alumnus, um, Maxine Aaron, talk about his work on tensor decomposition with applications to cybersecurity. He graduated with a BS and CS from UMBC in 2020, a master's two years later and is now a researcher at Los Alamos. So what, welcome, Maxine. Thank you so much for the invitation, Dr. Sherman. Let me share my screen. I hope this works. Can you guys see my screen? Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> hi, everyone. My name is Maxim. Today, I will talk about how we use our tensor decomposition methods for cybersecurity problems. Um, before we begin, though, I have a question uh, for you. If So I give this presentation to you, and at the end of the talk, maybe, or in the middle of it, anywhere you like, you have a question for me, and I don't know the answer to your question. Who would prefer, maybe on the chat we can put, or feel free to you know, unmute and talk, but who would prefer that I say I do not know uh, to, to answer to your question, or I take a wild guess? Seems to better say, I don't know. Yes, so I agree with that. Um, and I feel the same way for machine learning methods uh, that we use for cybersecurity. And tensor decomposition is a machine learning method uh, for cybersecurity. Instead of these methods making uh, a really confident wrong decision, I believe it's better when they're not sure, when under uncertainty, they let us know by saying, I do not know. So we will talk about several applications of tensor decomposition, but at the end, I will talk about a method that knows when it doesn't know. And I am still doing my PhD under Dr. Nicholas and also under uh, uh, Dr. Boyan Alexandrov uh, advice. So uh, all of the, many of the methods that we're gonna talk about is part of that work. So, Tensor decomposition is like a Swiss army knife. You can, we, we have been applying to anything from network anomaly detection to user behavior analysis, malware characterization. Uh, for data privacy with Dr. Roberto Yus at UMBC with using federated learning and also for critical infrastructure. It, it, it seems to be a very useful tool that, that we, we are throwing any problem that we're getting at it so far. And it, the methods that I will talk about today, uh, we, I will give a really brief overviews, but if you're more interested, the, the, the things I will mention are out there published and I have citations over here on the first two slides here, and I can say, share these slides and you can look it up further. And I'll be happy to talk about offline as well, more about them. But before we talk about how we are using tensors, let's begin with what is tensor decomposition? And I, and, and I think it's fun to start from all the way from like one dimensional uh, objects that are vectors. And if you add another dimension to it, it's, it's a matrix. Anything with three or more dimensions is called a tensor. And throughout this presentation, we will use 3D tensors because they're easy to visualize. But you can go up to any number of uh, dimensions you want. So let's assume you have a data set of user authentication events. So at an organization, you're collecting data of users making authentication. So one way to represent this data is in a matrix where one of your dimensions is user and the second dimension is device. So the entry on this matrix would be number of connections or authentication events a user i made to the device j so that's would be the entry over here on this matrix 
So let's take the same matrix and duplicate it. So you have two slices now, the one on the front and one on the back. So what I just did here is adding a third dimension that, that represents a successful authentication event or an unsuccessful authentication event. And let's say if the one, the slice in the front represents the times that you put your password wrong. So if you're like me, you put your password wrong a lot of times, you would be on the front more. This number over here would be, would be higher. So this is how you can represent an, it's an example of data with tensors. And one way to extract these hidden, the patterns from this tensor is called uh, CPD, CPD composition. And what we're trying to do here is we have this multi-dimensional object and we want to extract whatever useful pattern we, we have in there for decision making or downstream tasks. And we want to do this accurately. What do I mean by hidden patterns? I have this silly example here. Um, did you know that with the increase in ice cream consumption, the shark attacks increase? So what does that mean? There's some kind of correlation going on, right? But how is this useful? Not really, but when we say hidden patterns is that this other information that we're trying to describe. And in this, uh, in this funny example, it would be the increase in temperature. People go to the beach more, so they eat more ice creams and therefore there's more shark attacks. So that's the hidden pattern that we want to find from the tensor decomposition so that we can make decisions from that, those patterns. And I also mentioned accurate data modeling. What do I mean by accurate data modeling? Imagine this is your data. You have some uh, picture of where in the front you have this heart light and then in the back you have the Milky Way. When we say accurate data modeling, it is extracting parts of this data accurately and the parts that are useful and not including noise. So if these two features are what we care about. Accurate data modeling for us with tensor decomposition would mean I want to extract the patterns that are about this Milky Way and then this, uh, this, this light with the heart in the middle. But we also want to get really granular details. So further separating, if you have like mixed patterns, and in this case, it will be this uh, heart has lines around it. So assume that's a mixed pattern. Let's Let's get more granular information by separating the line uh, light from the heart in the middle. And that's what we're trying to do with our methods. And we call this automatic model determination. Uh, you can, another example that I really like is, is blind source separation, right? The ballroom problem. If, so in this WebEx, assume everybody was on mute, people were talking and it is recording. There's a microphone recording. And later on, somebody asks, how many people are in the room from this one recorded data? Everybody's talking at the same time. So the, our voices are mixed. So when we say accurate data modeling or blind source separation, what we would want to do is this unmix those voices to be able to answer how many people are in the room. So if you, let's say there's five people in this WebEx, and if you were to decide there are three people, right? It, it would not be accurate data modeling. Some of our voice is gonna be mixed. I am underfitting the data. And if I say there are 10 people instead of five, now I'm including some kind of noise. Maybe there's an AC in the background. I am including that noise. So I'm overfitting the data. So we, what we want to do is use the stability and accuracy of the solution with, with, with what we call the bootstrap approach to be able to heuristically determine how many unique signatures do I have such that when I do this pattern separation, I get clean results that are useful for me. So we talked about what is a tensor, how you could represent the data in a tensor, one method, how you would extract the patterns from a tensor. And then what does it mean for, what does it mean for the hidden patterns and what does it mean to do this accurately? So let's, let's now talk about our first application that's, and that's for anomaly detection. It is an important problem. It is expensive. 
the methods are there need improvement. So we want to focus on this. In the past, uh, research showed that you can do user behavior analysis using non-negative matrix factorization methods very accurately, but the information, <clears throat> information you, you, you convey, you, you have in this, in, this two dimension, uh, in this matrix is limited to the two dimensions. And at the same time, many popular machine learning models applied in this domain are black box. I don't know the decisions made out of the, 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 this, this methods, but I need to be able to interpret it because at the end of the day, the alerts or the decisions, whatever comes out of these methods goes to some security expert that is very expensive and I have to understand why this decision was made. And then these methods need a lot of labeled data for training, but as it's called, it's anomaly detection problem. So anomaly, right? So there is only a few of that. So you, I don't have a lot of labeled data to learn from. So I need a method that can actually do that. And that's where tensor decomposition becomes really useful because I am not limited to the to the to the to the two-dimensional information. I am modeling multi-dimensional activity profiles that can give me more complex details of, of what is going on. It, as you add more information, and in this case, you, you can see I added one more dimension, you're more realistically representing what is going on out there. You, you have more, more, more to see. And it produces actually interpretable results in comparison to these other black box methods. Because once you do your analysis on this tensor and you look at the patterns you extracted, they actually have meaning. What does that mean? Imagine if I were to represent human face pictures in this tensor. The patterns, for example, one pattern might be my nose, the other pattern might be my eyes, other pattern could be my eyelashes and so forth. So when you look at it, as an SME, you know what it means. For the cybersecurity case, maybe one pattern represents what is going on in the at night time, what is going on in the weekends, what is going on in the, for example, work day, work hours. And you can detect few anomalies hidden in a really large data with this methods, with, 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 this, with this methods. And we can generalize to many different kinds of problems. And I have Two examples here of <clears throat> what we're trying to detect with tensor decomposition. I really like the one on the left, so let's talk about that one. The one on the right is for critical infrastructure. But assume you have some users and they have their own devices, their computers. They're using to authenticate to some kind of destination device. So imagine a server that you're authenticating to, like you're doing an SSH from your own laptop. And one of the users is Eve. Eve has stolen the password of user two. So Eve is going to use their own computer to authenticate it to the destination server or device that is usually used by user two. So the anomaly here is user two never logged on to destination device three from source device three because source device three belongs to Eve. User two usually uses this source device two to authenticate it to that. So that's the anomaly we want to detect. And it turns out users in organizations create predictable patterns in time. And in this example, you can see on my Y axis, I have hours and on my X axis, I have days and the entries are a user making authentication to few computers. And this is a real data collected that uh, LANL and publicly released data set for user authentication events. And you can see there's a, there's a two week period where red team conduct, there was a red team activity where they stole user credentials and anomalous login what has happened for this one user. And we want to model this and we do this with tensor decomposition. We, we, we put this data in a multi-dimensional format. Um, here, my dimensions are user source and destination. So entry is a user making an authentication 
activity to, from the source device to this destination device. And we factorize this tensor with uh, canonical polyadic decomposition, CPD. And that factorization, the patterns I get from there represent my expected behavior. So I have this training set where I kind of believe it's, there is no anomalous activity. It's a, it's a weak label because it is possible. Maybe there was no alert generated for some, some, some bad thing happening, but I'm going to have the assumption that it's a clean data. And then the test time, I will go back and refer back to my fact, latent factors, latent here mean hidden features and see if compare how this new activity, what is the anomaly score for it? And we applied this to many problems, and this is a really busy table. So hang on with me for a second. Let's, let's just walk through it together. So I have over here left, you can see many different data sets where we are applying this method to. And I have this LANL one is the user authentication events. And I have tensors going all the way up to four dimensions. So you here means user source and S is source. And I can do user source destination and the final S means here status. Was it a successful authentication? And I can further add two more dimensions to make it the six dimensional tensor. And in this case, we have hour of the day and day of the week information. And then we also apply this to botnet traffic and the spam email data set, as well as credit card data. And what we want to, what we are highlighting here is they're, these are really large data sets. Um, I have up to six dimensions. So if you multiply these numbers together over here, you're going to get this huge, huge size tensor that if you try to fit on, 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 on your memory, if you try to load this data, it's, it's not going to work, but they're extremely sparse. What does that mean? I, imagine again, this authentication data set, you know, at, 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 that is collected at LANL. I am not using my computer to make an authentication to all other computers in the organization. I'm using maybe like a couple of the servers. Um, so it is sparse. There's a lot of empty values in this tensor, right? Going back over here, notice that we're modeling this, this behavior under Poisson distribution. That means I don't really care about the zeros I have in the tensor because Poisson is randomly occurring count of events, right? I, I can start at one. I don't need that zero information on my tensor. So I am actually just storing the occurred events and that doesn't take up a lot of space. And the other thing to highlight here, we're hunting for the needles in a haystack. So you have only few anomalies. You can see here, maybe like 76 anomalies occurred in total of 31,000 events. And what this has implications to your model has to detect these, but should have low, low false positive rates. Because you cannot just like, yes, you might be really good at detecting the 76, but at the same time, you detected 1000 total anomalies. That means this security engineer who has to look at this results later will have difficult time figuring out what is actually anomaly or not. So we want to be very precise in how we're detecting this. And the second thing, to, the, the third thing to notice here is when I added the temporal information to the tensor, and that is hour of the day or the day of the week, it became better at distinguishing between what is anomaly and what is benign. And we see that by, I have over here, if you look at my mouse, um, the, the P values or the scores for anomaly where low score means it is, it shouldn't have happened where if the score is high, it's, it's like, you can think of it like a probability, right? So you can see for the user destination, which is a matrix, my average P value is 0.63. While if I have this uh, five dimensional tensor, it reduces down to 0 0.10, 0 0.1, right? So it became better at giving a lower score to what is anomaly versus the benign values score has increased. That means they're, they're less likely to be, become classified as anomaly. So adding more information to tensor helped me distinguish between the two. 
And we apply this to many different problems and baseline with whatever state of the art there was out there for uh, semi-supervised methods, supervised methods, and, and if I missed, I'll, I'll say now, this is an unsupervised method, so you don't, have you don't need labels to train it. All you're doing is what is the expected behavior and versus what happened. I don't need labels. So we also compared unsupervised and many of the different tasks, diverse set of cybersecurity tasks, are method outperformed, outperformed whatever exists, except in the problem for detecting fraudulent credit card transactions, our baseline is doing better than us. But I will put an asterisk there because they are supervised methods, so they need labeled data. We don't. And two, they manually balance their data set. We didn't because that's not realistic. In real world, we get unbalanced data and that's the data we want to work with. So that's my asterisk on that baselining. And if anybody is interested to further explore this, this area, we have the, this data set that I mainly talked about that is user authentication events. It's called Unified Host and Network Data Set. There's a chapter that describes what the data set is and the day it is available publicly on this link here. And then the anomaly detection method we used here uh, with tensor decomposition as a code is also available on GitHub over here with GPU capabilities. So you can actually run this faster. The next area that we want to look at with tensor decomposition is for data privacy. And this is a work uh, we did with, <laughs> excuse me, this is a work we did with Dr. Roberto Yus at UMBC. And here we are, in this case, we're exploring the recommender systems. Uh, they are useful. <laughs> you, 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 you interact with recommender systems almost daily in your life, maybe. Um, when you go shopping, it recommends you what to buy. When you go to Netflix, which movie to watch, which music you might like, they're useful. They're, they're, it's a good utility for us. But um, and one way to do rec recommender systems is what's called collaborative filtering. What is collaborative filtering? Imagine uh, you watch, let's say, two movies on Netflix, and I watched one of them, one of the those two movies, it will recommend this, the collaborative filtering will recommend this other one I didn't watch, but you watched and liked. Because based on whatever collaboratively we did, what I might like is kind of the idea behind this. And traditional way to do this is when you have clients who send their data private user data to a central server. And in this central server, you're training the machine learning model. So there's no privacy here. That means whatever data I send to my server, if that server is compromised, I have lost my data. And there's implications for this. For example, in Europe, with the GDPR that uh, it's going to be costly for that company, right? And you, when we think of this as like movie recommendations, maybe that's, I don't know, maybe it's still not fine. You can infer a lot of information from whatever movie I might be watching. But imagine two hospitals trying to do this, collaborate, develop some kind of machine learning model. It's It could be a very impactful data that I am losing. The way to, one way to mitigate this is with what's called federated learning and specifically federated collaborative filtering, where the training of the ML model, it has moved to your device. You're not sending your data to the server, but you're training a local model and you're sending your maybe like gradient updates, whatever you're learning locally to the central server instead of sharing your private data. And the central server <clears throat> updates the central machine learning model with, with these patterns. 
the patterns are essentially what I'm sending. There's a few issues here. What if somebody leaves in the middle of the training? I no longer have that information. There's a heterogeneous data, right? And two, the iterative model updates are slow. So I need to like send this information gradients a lot of times to the central server because if you work with machine learning models, let's say from PyTorch or Transformers, um, there is the epoch or the number of iterations you set. That's the updates you're sending the, to the server, right? And also the research has shown that it's, it's a level of privacy. You're not actually introducing full privacy here because it turns out you can <clears throat> infer back the original data if you just get enough time to watch the gradients or the patterns you're sending. You can reconstruct the data so it's, it's, your data is, is still not safe. <clears throat> so the solution we have introduced for this is what's called one-shot federated collaborative filtering. So this iterative uh, model updates you're sending to server has now been reduced to a single round of communication. I have a kind of summary of what we're doing and I know there's a lot of boxes going on. Let's, walk, let's briefly walk through this together. You have clients, so you have N clients here, and a client is a group. You can think of a group like a household scenario. Uh, you and your family or your friends are watching Netflix on a single account, let's say, and you're giving uh, scores to the movies. Or you can think each client as a collaborating laboratory or a hospital. So you have some group data. You train with this group data, you, you train your local uh, collaborative filtering model. And this model has some kind of latent features. Um, and I should have drawn this on the slide, but now as we talk, I'm thinking maybe I need to show you this. So I'm gonna draw on the screen. Let's say you have this matrix X. And this matrix X, when we say training, it's not really training, it's you, you factorize this matrix, let's say, with non-negative matrix factorization for missing link prediction problem. What that means is I will get two latent factors. Let's call this W and let's call this H matrix. And here, let's say this is the movie so this, this rows over here has your movies and your columns could be, let's say, users. So this W matrix will have patterns, will have K patterns for your movies. <clears throat> you can actually just look at this W matrix and see which movies, movies are similar based on what these users liked. And then this K will have patterns for your, uh, this H matrix will have K patterns for your, let's say, users. You can also just only look at this H matrix and see which users are similar. If I multiply, if I take a dot product between these W and H matrix, I can reconstruct back to original X. But imagine I have like, places in X where I don't have information for, like, let's put a question mark here. So that means uh, this user here, uh, sorry, this user over here in the column did not watch this movie, but based on what, whatever information I have over here on this row, can I try to predict what movie, what, how, how this user would like that movie? And you can do this by multiplying these two factors together. And what we're doing here, this H transpose, you can see, and some kind of bias score, is what I'm uploading to my server. So what, what that means, I'm not gonna send this W, and I'm gonna send the H factor. You cannot reconstruct back X without having W, because that's the information you need for, for that dot product, right? If I am only sending H, that means, that's the latent patterns I have in the server. And then I, what I can do in the server is what's called 
joint factorization uh, where to, 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 to kind of get the patterns I have across each of the clients. And that's going to give me more latent factors, which are then uploaded back to my clients. And I do what's called knowledge distillation or transfer to put that information back to whatever local model I have to get an improved model locally. So when we do that, um, what, one thing we, we observe, we, we have to check, does the local model performance actually improve? So in this yellow line for two data sets, we have this yellow line. That is, what is the performance of the local model before I did federated learning? And what we want to do is a lower score, actually. Lower means better here. We are doing RMSC. That is, what is how different, how far is my decision from what it should have been? And it turns out when we did the federated learning, the local model became better at predicting. So yes, federated learning working. But how is it compared to our whatever state of the art exists out there. So these methods that require maybe like 100 epochs or number of iterations to reach to let's say RMSC 0.92, you can see here, while our methods perform better than these baselines. And for this larger data set, our method did not perform better in terms of the score, but we are doing single round of communication while they did 100 or like 500 rounds of communication. So what this means is you can, uh, you no longer need a lot of iterations to train this model. Okay, this is the last application area and this is the one I really like. Uh, this is the one where at the very beginning I mentioned a model that can say I do not know. So malware is a problem, there's a lot of them, millions of, that, of them reported every day and they cost a lot. So that means I can use machine learning methods to <clears throat> reduce the response and recovery time. That will also reduce the cost of me dealing with, with malware. But there are few issues and shortcomings in, in research um, that, that we need to address. One, may, we need to be able to um, in a real world scenario that is outside of this lab environment where I'm running my experiments. <coughs> I need to be able to handle class imbalance problem. Class imbalance problem in machine learning is you, in, the, in your data set, you have imbalanced information. So you can look at this picture. This, let's say these are different types of malware. The one on the middle is represented one time while the one around it represented four times. Does that mean my model should be really good at, if I train with this data, should be really good at detecting the, the, this, this red one over, around it? It should also be really good at detecting the rare one, in addition to the prominent ones. Because either way, if, if I'm compromised, it's gonna be costly. Maybe it, to some extent it matters with, by which malware, but I should still be able to detect the rare ones too. <clears throat> and supervised methods need a lot of labeled data to train, to learn from. But compared to other fields, getting labeled data for malware is, is more difficult, more expensive. Uh, it's gonna, it's some security engineer has to sit down and look at it, spend time, and that's, that's expensive, it takes time. And we need to be able to not only detect malware, but also point out when I see a new type of malware, hey, this is a new type. You need to develop new mitigation strategies that is different than just detecting it. So I need to be able to do all of these to kind of address the real world scenarios. I will breeze through two methods. One of them is random forest of tensors where we first start looking at malware using tensor decomposition and we found out Tensors are indeed useful and we can use semi-supervised approach where you have labels for some of your data. You don't need a lot of labels and use the patterns extracted from tensor decomposition 
and together with the sum amount of labels you have to make a decision on what are the unlabeled samples I have. And you can with low quantity and you can work with low quantity of data in that case. I'm not going to go in detail for this one, but I'll be happy to talk more about it if anybody has any questions. But in summary, we're generating random configuration of tensors. So what is my dimension? What is my entry? Factorizing each of these and taking an ensemble approach where I do a voting for each of the samples. And in the end, I will see what is the majority vote for the sample. And for the second method that we moved on to is HNMFK classifier. <laughs> and we took some of the ideas from, from the first method here for tens, uh, seeing semi-supervised is actually helping. But, but the previous method was not so good at working with de detecting novel malware families nor working with class and balance. So this method addresses that too. We have a world record applying this method to, to 2.9 thousand malware families simultaneously uh, compared to what has, was done previously in the literature. And what, what's happening here is I take a hierarchical approach I re remember from the very beginning of the presentation, on mixing the mixed patterns to get more detailed information is what we're doing here with a hierarchical approach to <coughs> continue applying, uh, uh, continue factorizing my tensor until I separate this mixed information so I can do better at classifying malware families and detecting novel malware. So this worked really well with class and balance, but it was okay in detecting novel malware families. Then uh, we came up with this method called malware DNA, and I will let you know in a second why we call it malware DNA. But <clears throat> this method simultaneously does three things. It detects malware, separate from benignware. It classifies malware families, and it also lets you know if, you, if it sees a novel type of malware. And it's called malware DNA because this method was in the past applied to uh, detecting cancers, mutations in human genome. And we, we think malware is like, malware also get, has mutations. In time, threat actors write a new code or change it to bypass security systems on, so, so it creates new variants of existing malware families. Or in time, you can think of it like a, like an evolution tree, in time you get like a new malware family out of it, right? So, so there's, an, uh, there's a similar analogy there, and we are added a few new techniques to this method to, to, to have it fit for malware analysis, and added the ability to be able to detect novel malware families. So here's a very brief uh, overview of how this method works. You, start with some kind of multi-dimensional data and of malware, and then you apply tensor decomposition to this data, and that gives you some clusters of malware. And you have some of, some of the samples in these clusters will have labels. And you can look at the labels as in, a, in a cluster in a semi-supervised manner at this point, because tensor decomposition was unsupervised. You can see, the labels I have in the cluster, are they uniform? Are they coming from a single class? So in this example, you can see I have two different classes, so it's not uniform yet. That means my patterns are mixed. Take a hierarchical approach to unmix them in a recursive manner. Otherwise, if I find a uniform one, the hypothesis is that here is this cluster has single class. That means one type of malware family. Therefore, whatever signatures I have for this cluster is representing the characteristics of the samples or the family I have in this cluster. So I can add those signatures to my archive. And at the inference time, when the new sample comes in, I can project that sample into the archive and characterize it. So I'm not only doing classification. I can say, this new sample looks like the uh, let's say 90% looks like this ransomware and 10% looks like this other malware that is leaving a backdoor on, on your system. 
So you can characterize what kind of behavior this malware could have. And the second thing you can do with it is what's called reject option or selective classification. This is studied in the past under uncertainty quantification, anomaly detection, and adversarial learning. And reject option brings in all of those fields together. And essentially that gives your model ability to say, I don't know. If you can say, I don't know, you can do cool things. And <clears throat> let me tell you what that cool things mean. Um, here's my, one of my favorite quotes from Einstein. The more I learn, the more I realize how much I do not know. So if knowledge is power, knowing what we do not know is wisdom. If, if your model has reject option capability, it gives your method self-awareness to, to know when it doesn't know. And it's useful for situations when if you make a mistake, it's really expensive. So imagine maybe like a critical infrastructure scenario. It will be cheaper if your model retained from making a decision and said, hey, I am not sure on this one. Go take a closer look. I will not make a decision instead of really confidently lying and something very expensive happens afterwards. Maybe you, in your head, you can think of scenarios or situations where that happened in the past. At the same time, if you can say, I do not know, that means you have knowledge discovery capability, right? If you're in a classroom and you're able to say, I do not know, you know what you need to learn. So for this machine learning model, in this specific scenario, being able to say, I do not know means you're discovering novel malware families. And you can do this in a large scale using HPC systems. I have a picture here. It's not fully representative, but just for demonstration, we have reduced my fe <coughs> our feature space to into two dimensions, just to visualize, where you can see on the first one, very heterogeneous mix of malware families. And as you apply hierarchical decomposition, your clusters become more homogeneous representing single malware family. And the fun thing is all of this, each, each of the, you can, okay, let's think of this as a graph and each node you're applying tensor factorization. Each of the subtrees in this graph is independent from each other. That means I can, uh, I can use a large HPC system and distribute computation of factorizing malware data and analyze really, really large data sets. And we applied this to, in, in early stages of this method, we applied to malware with static analysis based features with, to demonstrate how it is doing. And it turns out when you expose, so our baselines are XGBoost and LightGBM and they're semi-supervised versions with self-trained extension. I have handful of malware families and we select one of them to represent the novel one. So we want to detect the novel malware as novel and the rest we want to classify. And I also have benignware on my, my data set. So this methods over here that previously reported on this specific data set, benchmarks, their scores are much lower when they're exposed to much difficult problem of separating benignware from malware, classifying malware families and detecting normal malware they're not performing as well. And you can see our method, not only able to do simultaneously do all of these tasks, but also able to detect novel malware families. <clears throat> but in 2021 or 2022, there was a paper that argued that if you have a method that can re retain from, like make a decision with reject option, it's not fair to compare that method with, um, more uh, traditional uh, scores like F1, precision, or recall. We need to use what's called area under the risk coverage. So your risk over here is one minus whatever score you had. In this case, you can imagine it as like a F1 score. And your coverage is <clears throat> how much of the samples am I able to make a decision on? And this is a line where you can choose a spot, whichever, for whatever problem you have. And you want this line to be as low as possible. So area under this curve should be low 
because you would want ideally no risk, but really high coverage, make a decision for all the samples. <clears throat> and this measures the discriminative ability of the method because you want to, um, when you say this is a novel family, was it a really novel or you should have known from your training data it, it existed before? How accurate are you in doing that? And two, when you make a decision for a family, are you doing it accurately? So that's discriminative ability that we want to measure here. And we want a low area under the curve for this line. And you can see with this method, it is low. And one way to also see this is, yes, we're detecting no, all the novel families, but 15% of the time, I'm, I, when I say something is novel, I made a mistake. The other thing we <coughs> test is, tested this method is for quantity of labeled data. We mentioned that it is expensive, right? So you can, on the y-axis, you can see a score and each of the line or lines represent a family. And on the y-axis, you can see us reducing the number of, uh, the fraction of samples I have in my training set all the way down to 5%. So 95% of my samples was in the testing set. And what you can see is this method maintains, relatively maintains its performance as we reduce the data, as we reduce the, um, my, my, my training set amount of samples I have there. And that is because instead of beginning to make wrong decisions, what it begins to do, it will tell you more of I do not know. So it maintains the performance of the model. Another experiment we run where we had um, seven malware families, one of them was novel, and we downsampled three of them <coughs> to see how this uh, benchmarking baselines, both supervised and semi-supervised, behave for rare malware while co in compared to ours. What I'm highlighting here is Imotet, Farid, and Zussi malware families in red. The first four bars over here are my baseline models, both semi-supervised and supervised. And the last three is our method with different kind of confidence matrix. And what you can see is these methods are not able to perform well when, when they're trying to make a decision for rare malware families. And that's because in their training set, they didn't have enough data to learn the patterns of these, of these samples. They require a lot of data to see, to understand what the patterns are so, are so that they can make a decision while our method maintain its performance for the rare classes as well, as well as detecting the, 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 the novel malware family. So if you're interested in um, exploring more of the tensor decomposition methods uh, we have, especially in this area as well, <clears throat> we have this code available publicly uh, and it has also other uh, techniques where, because we, we apply this tensor decompositions to anywhere from biology to text mining, material science, and other fields. So you will see other uh, tools there for like text pre-processing and cleaning and building ma matrices and, and tensors. So that code is publicly available. And I have the website here for our tensors work uh, where you can see other fields where we're applying to. And um, I can share these slides with you. At the beginning, I had citations for these methods that we, we presented here, and you can find them publicly on this website on the right time. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your time and listening. Please let me know if you have any questions. Can you characterize mathematically the uh, performance properties of the methods that you've described. Can, would you please expand that on, on that question a bit more? Well, for example, in terms of um, confidence levels or types of errors or any other type of characterization in a precise mathematical sense. Uh, so we, we used F1 score, is, that was one of the ways where we characterize how well it is performing. And 
on this example, you can see I have this error bars. We are running these experiments with cross validation and several number of times. <laughs> and to show it's statistically significant, we used the confidence interval for it. Um, we also used metrics like precision recall, what fraction of the samples has been falsely classified as novel. But we think the most fair way to look at this is what's called the area under the risk coverage. I hope I was able to answer your question. If not, please let me know. Hi, Maxim. Hey, Anis. Um, this was a very nice talk. Thank you. So it seems like one of the main insights that allowed you to build malware DNA is this idea of rejection. Um, I, I suppose my question is, is, is rejection, is the ability for a model to reject, um, to reject observations or to say, I don't know, is there a trade-off to that or would you qualify it as a strict advantage for a model to be able to do this like is there any reason why you would want to at this point build a model that's incapable of this because it seems like it's strictly better based on what you're showing here but I'm, I'm curious about that that's a really fair question um thank you so much for asking that i think you you gain some you lose some right and let me see yes i think this slide is a good good place we can look at I will be biased in saying I will always really like models that are able to say I do not know because that's what as in my friends or my colleagues I also look for right if you do not know I need to know when you do not know but I am biased in that because I'm trying to finish my PhD using this method but yes you're right there's a trade-off because rejection scene, you can see here, I could have made a, maybe, uh, maybe my score may have gone down a little bit, but I didn't have to uh, falsely uh, classify this 15.7% of my actually known samples as novel. So that is, the, that is one trade-off that I can think of. Okay. Um... So in, in this table, it sh you show that, that malware DNA has c considerably higher scores than all these other methods. Is that purely a result of using rejection in your model or are there other, is this also a result of adding say dimensions or some other technique? Because you've significantly improved on what exists. And I guess I'm trying to put two and two together. That's, a, that's a, another really good question. <laughs> I think rejection option helps. Uh, I need to investigate the, the, so building a tensor, the configuration of it, it's kind of maybe I want to call it a tedious task because what, what features do I want to put in which dimension and what are my entries? And that's why uh, the very first method we looked at was random forest of tensors. So I went with the lazy route and I said, I don't want to spend a lot of time figuring out, figuring out which features I want to use in my tensor dimensions. I will just choose them very randomly and ensemble approach, wisdom of crowds will help me to make a good decision still. I have not investigated if that is contributing, but I can say that these methods, XGBoost, like GBM, they perform very well on this data set previously. Many papers who published using these data sets <clears throat> using this data set benchmark often with these methods. The reason why you see very low scores over here, uh, so I, I guess part one of your question, more investigation needed, which parts of my method is contributing highly to the scores. But the second part, why they're low is because we are exposing them to a more difficult problem than just classify malware versus benignware or just classify malware families or detect novel malware families, three different tasks. We're doing all of them simultaneously, all at the same time now, resulting in lower scores. 
Um, in one of our papers, we reported the methods, uh, these methods scores, where we also excluded the novel families. They were higher, but they were still much lower than our method because you're you're trying you're including benign samples in your data set too. So it's a much more difficult problem. Um, so I think that is one of the reasons contributing to the lower scores we see with this benchmarking methods. Okay, that's a, that's a very nice answer. Thank you. It sounds like you have a lot of fun, exciting work you can do in the near future, including trying to figure out just how you were able to, what I'm going to be blunt, revolutionize this, uh, you know, the, the learning for this problem, because your model is outperforming the other models to a degree that is, uh, you know, it, it almost looks anomalous. Like it looks like the other models to, are just not suited for this problem at all. And I'd be curious to know why your model is um, and specifically how those techniques are impacting that. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot more to look at for our method to gain a deeper understanding what is going on. And these methods, I so far from what I'm seeing, they're not suited for this problem. And what could be interesting is to, to, to maybe see if there's other models that, that are more suited to this problem, because these methods are, are the benchmarks for this data set, but maybe from, from what you're saying now, what I'm realizing is what I also need to look at to go out there and see the methods that are not for malware, but that are used with, with, a, with like, a, they have uncertainty quantification and so forth, and they see how they can be introduced to this area and if they are, how they compare to my methods, uh, our method, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anis. So I have a question which is more about like tensor decomposition in general rather than like the specific project. Um, so when you have like a tensor decomposition of like a data set, like are you able to reconstruct the original data exactly from the decomposition or is it kind of like an approximate thing? I would say it's an approximate thing you would. So let me, let's go back to a picture of tensors. If you, if you exactly reconstruct your data, you don't really have these patterns that you're interested in. What you, we can maybe think of this as, maybe right way to think of this is, it's a dimensionality reduction problem. And when I dis, you reduce the dimensionality of my problem, what I am looking at is the useful information, the patterns. If I also, if I don't do that, I can exactly reconstruct my original tensor. I am still including the noise that I have. And you can actually reconstruct the original tensor if you set this rank high enough. This is a hyperparameter here. And it is the hyperparameter that we have methods to heuristically estimate to say, if you recall, how many people are in the room based on the voices would be this R. How many patterns do I have? If I set this high enough, I'm reconstructing the original tensor. If I set even higher, I mean, maybe just including much more noise. Um, but if you set it low, is like, what is the useful inform? What is the rank such that I have useful number of patterns in that I can find from the tensor? Okay, uh, that makes sense. Uh, so, so you want to not uh, choose the value of R too high because then you are just capturing noise rather than the patterns. Right, and if you choose it too low, I am mixing information. So what is the right number of R? It's an MP hard problem, choosing the rank for the tensor, but you can heuristically estimate it by uh, using like, okay, more traditional machine learning way could be, for example, you would have a validation data set where you, cho cho you try for different ranks and see which rank gives you the highest score. And then that's the rank that you use for your testing set. We don't do that. We use different metrics for accuracy of the solution and the stability of the clusters using custom clustering techniques that are similar to k-means um, to see based on different clusters that I might get in a also bootstrap approach, how is the 
stability in my solution is changing. So let me try to describe that on the screen because I think I just throw out a lot of uh, terms there. So if I have two clusters, uh, if I have two clusters and maybe they're mixed and you can look at the stability of that using, let's say, silhouette score, how separate are they? And if I have three clusters, maybe all of a sudden my data set become more separate and that means it's stable. Um, and we do this with the bootstrap approach I mentioned. And that why we do that is the idea that my solution should remain stable under noise. So you can add some noise, really small amount to your data and see how clusters are changing. And if you can find the number of clusters that this noise is not affecting much, they're stable. And that's kind of the idea for the heuristically determining the rank on our end. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Aaron, for an interesting talk. Um, we'll be back in two weeks when um, Anupam Yoshi will present some of his ongoing research. Also, um, we invite all of you to uh, join us for the CDL hike, which will be Saturday, um, April 13th. This concludes the session. Bye.